Well, thank you so much for coming out. I'm thrilled to see how many people like movies because you're out for a movie night. You didn't know? No, you didn't know. You know, usually, usually a movie is made after a book. Okay? This is the only book written after the movie. Yes, the book of Revelation was the movie first and then the book. Yes, God showed John the movie. He saw things and then God told him, now you sit down and write it down. Okay, so uh, welcome. I believe we will have a wonderful experience, wonderful journey together. Let's pray for that. Lord, we thank you so much for this pause we can have with you. We can uh, come to rest in you and we can learn from you. And this is a privilege to us. We pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and uh, Jesus Christ will be lifted up. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. That is a short and symbolic way to represent the book of Revelation. I will explain later what it is about. The book of Revelation starts with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is important to emphasize because the book of Revelation is not the revelation of the beast, is not the revelation of the dragon. Yes, the book of Revelation speaks about those fig figures or entities as well. But the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants Things which must shortly take place in quickness. That's a better translation. Things that will take place in quickness or in haste. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Now I want to emphasize this word, signified, because signified refers to a code that is used so you can understand the book of Revelation. When uh, something signifies something, it means that you need to go beyond or behind what that thing is. If, say, this signifies an elephant, if you know the code, whenever you see this, you can think of an elephant. If you don't know what the code is, whenever you see this thing, what do you think of? Just what it is. But if there is a signified meaning, a coded meaning, then whenever you see this, what is this? An elephant. Because we gave this pan a code meaning, right? Something that goes beyond the immediate meaning. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. What is prophecy? Well, prophecy is a pretty simple process. I will need Michael to help me to signify what prophecy is. Come, come here, please. Come join me. Prophecy is this. I tell Michael something. Okay? Yeah. And tell Michael, Michael, this message I'm giving to you, you go and give it to them. Okay. Then you go and give it to them. That's a prophet. A prophet is somebody that takes the message from the giver of the message 
and carries it to those that need that specific message. So the book of Revelation is prophecy. Now, when you hear prophecy, most of the time, you would think about prophecy about the future. Things that have never happened, but will happen in the future. Therefore, we are having a revelation of the future, future in advance. Well, that is one meaning of prophecy. It's also called foretelling prophecy. But there is another way of doing prophecy, which is forth-telling. Not foretelling, but forth-telling. Which means that prophecy can also have a meaning for the present realities. When somebody comes from God with a prophetic message for the present. Forth-telling. For instance, a prophet can go to somebody and tell him or her things that he or she thinks nobody knows. Like reveal his or her sins. And he would say, <gasps> really? Yeah, you did this two hours ago. That is a fourth telling prophecy. If somebody comes as a prophet from God and says, something will happen to you, or this and this and this will happen to you three years from now, that is a foretelling prophecy. Blessed is who reads, what is that, singular or plural? Singular. Blessed is he who reads, and those who? Is that singular or plural? The words of this prophecy and keep, is that singular or plural? Singular is keeps. He keeps. It's plural. You know why? Very simple reason. In those days, not everybody knew how to read. And the message was actually given to the messenger of the church. The messenger of the church is somebody that is able to read the writing. So practically what the text says, blessed is he who reads. It's like me standing in front of you, having a scroll with the letter, reading it in front of you, and you all hear it. And you all, including me, keep it. Right? So when we look at the book of Revelation, it's obvious that if those people were blessed, and the Greek word is makarios. Makarios, which means happy. Happy, the one that reads. So the book of Revelation initially was a letter. A letter written to some people. So somebody can read the letter in front of them. And those who listen to it, those who hear it, will be happy. Then I'm asking you, did they understand it? Can you be happy about something you don't understand? No. Very difficult to be happy if you don't understand it. Well, if they were happy and blessed, reading it, well, that one person that read it to them, and they could hear it, and even keep it, because if it didn't say keep it, then you would say, hey, maybe they, they couldn't understand. But how can you keep it if you don't get it? So it, it must be that they could understand, otherwise they couldn't have kept it. So what did they need in order to be able to understand? Well, they needed to know the code. In other words, the way the book of Revelation is written, for those people in those times, was not all that difficult to understand because they knew the language. They understood the code. Those codes were used in those circles of uh, Christians at the end, practically, of the first century, at the beginning of the Christian era. Right? 
Blessed is he who reads. If you read something that really is a blessing, you can be blessed and happy about it. I don't know how many of you have ever written letters and sent letters or received letters. Well, I, I was born just about the time when letters were still in use and then they all moved into the virtual reality. But I still had the chance to write a few love letters and receive a few love letters. And whenever I uh, received one, I think when I sent one, somebody was happy too, I don't know. But when I received one, most of the time I was happy. My mom was even happier. Because by the time I got home, she would open it and read it. <laughs> and, then, and then I would be surprised, because mom would tell me things, you know, hints. And I'd say, huh? How do you know that? Well, she opened the letter. She was happy. <laughs> Reading. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm just emphasizing the role of letters in those days. Letters were something wonderful. It was more, probably more intimate than when you receive a text message from a very loved or missed family member that you haven't had the chance to meet for quite some time. And when you receive a short text, you say, ah, nah, but if, if it's a long one, and say, yeah, let me go to it and read. So the book of Revelation is that kind of a writing. Now, I have a construction here, and I had it right at the beginning, and I said, I'm going to explain what that means. You know, every culture has a different way of thinking. We are taught, especially in academia, that we should be thinking like this, A, B, C, right? That's the academic way of thinking, of reasoning, of creating thoughts and putting thoughts to together. Not everybody thinks like that. For instance, the classical German way of thinking is this. A, which is thesis, B, antithesis, and then out of the two you have a C, which is a synthesis of the two. Another way of thinking, if you read like a French novel, a French novel is written like this, A, it starts in A, then it goes, then it comes, then it turns, then it goes again, and it goes all around, and it's so, co but hey, you read B. <laughs> and that's one way of thinking. Then, there are ways of thinking that are very used in some African cultures. In African cultures, people think like this. They sit down in a circle, and uh, they start putting petals on a flower. They go round and round. Everybody contributes with something. At the end of the night, you can ask them what it was about, and they may say, I don't exactly know, but it was so beautiful. <laughs> but that is a way of processing, of thinking. N nothing wrong about it. Because if you had a chance to sit down and have a good talk, that's a blessing in itself, right? Or, this is more like an Asian way of thinking. When you have a point, and uh, you go round and round, round and round, you are talking about this point. You're going round and round, but you never hit the point. You just hint on it. But those in that culture know exactly what you are talking about. 
Now, you may think, okay, what does this have to do with the book of Revelation? Well, simple. The book of Revelation is written in a Hebrew way of thinking. You know why? Because the guy that wrote it was a Jew. And a, a Hebrew way of thinking is like this. A, B, A. And this is called a chiastic structure. In the Bible, in many sections of the Bible, you have this kind of structure. A, B, A. And that is true about the book of Revelation as well, because the book of Revelation is such a structure. Look, the book of Revelation is made of seven sections. The first section is paralleled by the seventh section. The second section is paralleled by... Which one? Six. By the sixth. The third section is paralleled by the fifth. And at the top of the mountain, you have the fourth section. And guess what section is that? It's Revelation 12 to 14. as the core of the book of Revelation. We are not going to do a systematic, thematic study. Take, for instance, the meaning of horns. And then go throughout the Bible and see what horn means in the Bible. We are not going to do that. What I'm trying to do is to show the beauty of the text, of the story of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a story. It is a story told in code, but the story can be told in plain language as well. Now, some of the codes you already know. I would say most of the codes you already know. Even just reading through the text, you will understand the code in most parts. There will be places where the code is difficult to uncode. And I have to admit, and this is one of the most important things when you come to the book of Revelation, you have to admit you cannot know everything, or you will not be able to know everything like that. It takes humbleness to recognize that some sections are very, very, very difficult to understand. But the story by and large is not difficult to get. It's as simple as uh, the elderly guy that said, hey, I don't get too much out of it, but from what I can see, Jesus is going to win. You know? <laughs> from that perspective, it's pretty simple. But we are interested in details as well, right? Okay. Yeah, we are in section one, and for you to have a clearer picture of it, I uh, turned the mountain the other way around, and uh, here you have the seven churches. That's the first section, and you can see here that before every section out of the seven major sections, there is an introductory vision and those introductory visions have to do with the sanctuary, with the sanctuary service and things that happen in the sanctuary. So the first story, the first section, is about Jesus among the candlesticks. Where were the candlesticks in biblical times? Holy or most holy? In the holy place. Okay? Jesus is among the candlesticks. You know Jesus is the light. And the code for candlesticks, does anybody know what the code for candlesticks is? The churches. So the very simple picture is what? Jesus walking among candlesticks, meaning 
Jesus is the light of the churches. Simple, right? Let's uh, go to the text then. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In short, because of his beliefs and because of how he practiced his faith, he was exiled to the island called Patmos. And there, according to history, there was a quarry. We don't know if he actually worked in the quarry or not, because he was an elderly guy. Yeah, he was old. We don't know if he worked or not, but he was isolated from his folks, from the churches. So he's like a loner, you know, on that island, or possibly a missionary, because we don't have details. That uh, island seemed to have been some sort of a prison island, where political prisoners were exiled. So he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day obviously has to be Saturday, the Sabbath, because biblically that's the Lord's Day. So on a Saturday, on a Sabbath, he was in the spirit. Hard to say what exactly that means. But obviously in that state of uh, heart and mind, which he calls I was in the spirit, maybe meditating in the spirit, maybe... Uh, well, he's not having a vision yet. So he is in the spirit and then the vision starts. Because he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me... So this is the, the cue for the vision. First he hears behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Okay? So when, when you hear the sound of a trumpet, what is your instinct? What is that? Right? And that's exactly what he does. The sound that he heard says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see right in a book. And this is where the movie starts. Right? I, I said it's a movie that was written then in a book. What you see right in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now you may think, okay, so why these churches? Because for instance, not far from Laodicea, you had the church of Colossae. Why is Colossae missed? Why these seven churches and not others? Well, let's remember where John is. Where is John? He's on an island. He has to send the letter. And uh, if you want to send the letter as a prisoner, there is good chance when uh, you give it to somebody, they will check it first. <laughs> and then send it if they decide to send it. Right? So censorship is a real issue there. So God works with John in a way that the message can get from the island Patmos, past the censorship of uh, the Roman Empire, because by the way, in that book, there are sensitive things about the Roman Empire as well. Okay, so you better watch out. So what do you need for that? A code? Okay. You know, I remember I, I was listening to somebody that used to be the head of the Romanian resistance during the communist regime. And uh, he was in France, he lived in France, but from there he was coordinating the resistance against the communist regime in Romania. So from time to time they would fly a plane just past the borders and drop some young uh, crazy guys, parachute them into the country, so they will be able to spy and see what's going on. And uh, if something happened, then they would write through a code. And he says, one day the letter came and uh, one of the guys that was parachuted 
was writing this. I'm in the hospital. I need five units of penicillin. What does that mean? Well, hospital was prison. And the 5,000 units was 5,000 maybe dollars or some sort of European currency. So the point was they cut me, put me in prison, and for me to get out, I need 5,000. So can you see the difference? So it's practically two, two messages. Same words, but the code gives the meaning. Okay, so he's on uh, Patmos, and he is given seven churches. Now, the seven in itself, for a Hebrew mind, what does it mean? It's completeness, but in what context? Because most of the time in the Bible, seven has to do with time. It's time from the very beginning. It's seven consecutive days. Or you have seven years or 70 years. So in, in, in various contexts in the Bible, the seven, code for seven, is time-related. A complete period of time. History. Some sort of history. And it's interesting that these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Theatura, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, they are all laid out on a main road in Asia Minor. It's the road where the postal coach, I think that's how, how you say it, or diligence, the, the cart that carried the letters from one place to the other would go. Just imagine this. I am exiled to one of the islands in the Pacific. And uh, I am given by God a message to send it to you. If I have a complete layout of history from this point to the end, in seven steps, what would be a code for me to use? And God can even help me with that. Well, take I-5, I-5, the highway, the, the interstate, right? And take the churches that are on I-5 in a row, okay? Miss all the other churches, like I would miss this church because it's not on I-5 really, or not very close. But I suppose, I didn't check the map, but I suppose there are churches that are right on, on the big interstate. Take seven of those in a row, and when you look at them, you'll say, oh, wow, I've seen this before where? In the book of Revelation. So you already have a code. Okay? So that's what's happening here. God is giving him an order of seven churches in the exact order where they follow one another on that road. Because in the seven churches... Describing realities that are happening in those churches in those days, he signifies, remember the word, signified, signifies realities leading up to the end. So I have seven churches here, seven periods. One, Ephesus. What's next? Smyrna. What's next? Pergamon. Thyatira, Sardis, okay, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, question. Are we sure we have the right code? How? How do you know the code is valid? Where did God say it? Because it's logical, it's, it's very obvious, so it, it, it carries the water of logic. But, but try, try to get this, never be happy or satisfied or blessed, because blessed is he who, okay, just because it's logical. 
make sure you want to go deeper and you want to see it from the text because the text proves it that is correct how well first in the vision that uh, John starts having the movie he starts having he says then I turned to see the voice that uh, spoke with me right and having turned I saw the seven golden lampstand so he turns he sees the voice that speaks with him actually you cannot see a voice can you see a voice so the meaning the meaning obviously is that he saw the one speaking to him okay and having turned I saw seven golden uh, lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man is he the son of man or just like the son of man how does he know he's like the son of man oh, he knew him they spent years together right he was like the son of man but something was different obviously if he doesn't say hey it was the son of man Boom. right one like a son of man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band what kind of garment is this what kind of clothes are these let me ask you if you see a buddhist tibetan or that's how you say it, tibetan buddhist monk how do you know that's a monk first clothes and how do you know it's a specific kind of monk a Tibetan monk the color the color right so there are some specifics how do you know who this person like the son of man is a garment that goes to the feet girded about the chest with a like here with a golden band who's that his head and hair are white like wool mm, that's a symbol that's a code for what wisdom wisdom right white as snow and uh, his eyes like a flame of fire what is that penetrating right somebody that knows right all knowledge or omniscience right his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and later on it's explained, angels or messengers. Okay, angels, not in the sense of uh, aliens, right? But angel in the bible can simply mean messenger somebody that carries a message from here there okay seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword have you ever noticed that word and sword have the same uh, letters almost sword has one more letter but it's sword word here the two meet they overlap and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength who's this person it's obvious that it's Jesus Christ right but in what role what is his garment like he's a priest because he is among the candlesticks and where are the candlesticks in the sanctuary and who gets entrance in the sanctuary priest so the code works right okay and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead but he laid his right hand on me saying to me do not be afraid I am the first and the last why don't be afraid why that message well this is an elderly guy exiled lonely possibly all his companions are gone they tried to kill him according to tradition they threw him into boiling oil he didn't burn so they got afraid and they exiled him 
But now, in his solitude there, he seems to be afraid. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Jesus has two very interesting specific uh, features. One is light, and one is the two-edged sword. It's like a surgeon. A surgeon needs light, right? Yeah. To see where to cut, and needs what? A scalpel, a two-edged sword, to know how to cut. Okay? And that's Jesus Christ there. Very interesting imagery. But he is a priest. He is also a judge, according to the description. And later on, we'll see him as a king as well. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Obviously, is Jesus. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are... And the things which will take place after this. Please notice these two elements. The book of Revelation contains two kind of things. Things that are at that time. And that's the description of the seven churches. But then, there's a description of things which will take place after those things. And from chapter 4 on, we are dealing with that part. So we are coming now to the seven churches. I will not have time to go verse by verse through it, but I will try to show how beautiful the text confirms that the code is indeed valid. That the seven churches signify, the word signify from the very beginning, seven periods in the history of Christianity from Jesus' time, like from here, Say, here we have the cross, all the way to the end of history and the renewal of all things. First church, Ephesus, they are all right in many ways. Strong in faith, fighting against some uh, heresies that try to infiltrate the church. But their love is already fading. And this is what it says. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So something, something is fading away with that church. Smyrna. Smyrna experiences fierce persecution. Terrible things happen. And you can go and read through it when you get home. And uh, Jesus says, because Jesus has a message, a specific message, through the messenger of that church, to that specific church, and I know the blasphemy, which is slander, of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Synagogue of Satan. So something really bad is happening there. It's a confrontation of the Church of Christ with some people that masquerade as such. Then Pergamos is a church where the false doctrines pop up. You have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So, in the church of uh, Pergamos, we already have problems, serious problems. The teaching of the church is altered. But now, there is something interesting. When we get to Thyatira, we can see that now the majority becomes corrupt. And only a minority is faithful. Up to this point, it seems that the majority is faithful. The minority is corrupt. From this point on, and, and remember, this is number four, right? So it's right in the middle. If you uh, imagine a graph mathematically, that's exactly where the percentages change, the tipping point. 
right? Now, to you I say, and to the rest, so in Tyre, you already have a rest. That's the same word for remnant. So the majority is already corrupt, but there is a rest that is still faithful. As many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. So you still have some people there. But watch this, and this is, I think, amazing. When we come to the tipping point, where the majority is now corrupt and only a minority is faithful, to the church of Thyatira, Jesus says, but hold fast what you have till, till what? I till I come. So let me show where we are. We are here, in the middle. What's the message? Hold fast what you have till I come. Who says that? What coming is he talking about? The one that happens there. Are you sure? Well, let's see. Let's see if the code is valid indeed. Uh, Sardis. Sardis is spiritually dead. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. However, even if they are dead generally, you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garment. So if somebody thought the light went off, I totally, no, no, Jesus is still walking among the candlesticks. See, remember, the, the introductory vision, the sanctuary vision, always has to do with the whole picture. So you have to see the whole story through the lenses of that introductory vision. Jesus, the light, is walking among the candlesticks. Can then the light go off? No. no. Because he is light. And there will always be at least a few. But when, when there's only a few, watch this now. And we are here. We are here. Look at the message. Therefore... If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Is this more than the previous message? What was the previous message? Till I come, period. Very general, I would say almost vague. You are coming when? We don't know. But here we know something. What do we know? He comes in a certain way. There is a certain surprise in the way he's coming. Okay? Let's move on. Philadelphia, a little strength. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little, little strength. And the message? Behold, I'm coming. Does this say something more than the previous? What was the previous? I'm coming as a thief. We still don't know when. Here it says, I'm coming quickly. The one prior to the previous, until I come. Very general. Then I'm coming like a thief. And then... I'm coming, how? Quickly. Quickly. And we are right here. Now, before I show the text, tell me what's next. Laodicea. Yeah, it's Laodicea. And the Laodicea has a problem. They are dangerously lukewarm. They are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. And Jesus says, I will vomit. A better translation is spit, and I will explain later what it means. I'll spit or spew you out of my mouth. Because vomit, vomit means to come from the stomach, right? Spit is from the mouth, mostly. What do you think says the message to Laodicea about Jesus' coming? 
Well, he's not coming. Where is he? So then I'm asking, is the code valid or not? If in the darkest period of history, because we said, okay, most likely the code is seven periods of times because it's seven, seven consecutive periods. That's the code. In the darkest segment, right in the middle, and that's why it's called the middle, dark middle age, the message of the, coming, uh, of, the, of the coming of Jesus pops up, not very specific, but it gets more and more and more and more and more specific until Jesus is where? You know Jesus, when he was on earth, he said, when you are going to see these things, you know, I'm at the, at the door. I'm right at the door. I know you have heard dozens of sermons about how Jesus is knocking on uh, your heart. Valid. No problem. How Jesus is knocking on the, home, on the door of your home. Valid too. But contextually, if, if you want to be faithful to the context of the text, this is primarily about Jesus being at the door of history, ready to step in. Right? So then just quickly, let's see the message to Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right. These things say, says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This is Jesus, of course. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. What is this about? This is cold again. If you were from Laodicea, you would understand. Because in Laodicea, they piped in the water from somewhere. And by the time the water got there, it was lukewarm. Because if, if it had been, say, cold, then it would warm up. If it had been warm, it would cool down. So imagine somebody like... Jesus walking in the heat of the sun on uh, one of those summer days and he wants water and somebody gives him water that just came from the pipe and you take it into your mouth and you do what? <laughs> I, I did that with Alessandra in the, in the car. She was, she was throwing a tantrum that she wants to drink. And in the car there was a little bottle with lukewarm water. Handed it to her and, wait, and was waiting, you know? And she, and she <laughs> so, so that's the picture. It's not about vomiting. I even heard sermons uh, uh, where, where the preacher was saying, God is sick at his stomach. It's, it's not that. It's, it's a reality, a very dangerous reality. It's not like God is rejecting you. He's not rejecting you. How do I know? Because you say, I am rich, become, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He still offers something, right? So that means he did not reject you. He offers what? Exactly what you need for those three problems. Poor, it's like you're a beggar. You're a beggar, you're poor, you're naked. You're blind, and you think you're a prince. And Jesus says, hey, wake up. In order for you to be like that, you need from me gold, so you're not poor. You need white garments, so you're not naked. And you need what? I sell, so you are not blind. But watch this. That, that harsh... Laodicea message says, as many as I love, I rebuke. 
and chasten. But the focus is not on rebuke and chasten, it's on love. But you cannot not see that there is rebuke and chasten there too. See how the gospel works? Grace and truth. Grace goes first and then truth. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, or reprove and discipline, or correct and instruct. I think that's the best translation, correct and instruct. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So, so here, Jesus is at the door, and, and he's still pleading, hey, 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 repent, repent. Why does he say buy gold? If you're poor and naked, how do you have money to buy anything? Why would you buy? Instead of that I will give you? Very good question. My, my thought on that is that uh, the reason why the word bought is, and I, I went to the Greek to see what the word is, and it comes from agora, which is market, agorazomai. So, so the market is in view. It's like you have to give up something so you can get that. So you have to give up your wealth here on earth to get wealth in heaven? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Because the way we would do it, and, and you can see in the reaction of some beggars sometimes, you want to help them and they would take what you want to give them, but they would keep what they have. If they have some rags, they would keep the rag and also take your clothes. So it's like, hey, you have to give that to me and uh, yeah. And this is the, the final uh, section, well, almost the final section. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and uh, sat down with my father on his throne. So this is right after the behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is pictured as an itinerant merchant. Do you know what that is, an itinerant merchant? Somebody that walks around and uh, sells things. Okay. Um, back in the day, in some parts of the world, those itinerant merchants would just walk through the city or through the village, knock at the door, trying to sell something, <laughs> offering something to you. And they would even sit at the table with you. If you were sitting at the table, it happened to, to us several times, I remember well, we were sitting at the table, eating, and somebody knocked at the door, the itinerant merchant. We invited him in and offered him to sit down and eat with us. Now, this also calls in view the wedding, the fellowship table, or not potluck, because for potluck you bring your stuff. <laughs> but but that, that meal of the wedding of the Lamb that the book of Revelation speaks about later on. Okay? So that's the message of the first story, the first section of the book of Revelation. Right here, section one, and uh, what is the takeaway? Well, Jesus is serious about what he's saying. If he said he's coming, he is coming. Now, one day I was visiting somebody in, in my district, in a city, and uh, the woman from the house, the wife of an elder, said, hey, I'm so happy. Well, actually, I could see how happy she was. She said, Greg, Greg being her son that lived in Spain and, and she was in Romania, Greg and his family is coming. And she was all over the place, you know, bubbly. And I said, I looked at her and I said, what if they don't come? <laughs> and she froze, she froze. And then she said, pastor, they said, they are coming and they are coming. <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> you know? He said he's coming, so he is coming.
There are two elements, present and future, correct. So yeah, uh, and, and there is another section, I don't have it on screen here, in chapter four, right at the beginning, in chapter four, where it indicates that point on, it's things that will happen, right? Because up to that point, Yes, so those are the things that will happen after. So up to that point, we have this double reality. We have the reality of present, the description of the churches. Those were real churches, and those features were features of real churches. But they were also signifying another reality leading up to that final second coming. And then you have chapter 4, and from that point on, it's all in the future from that perspective, right? Much of the descriptions of the seven churches are not even symbolic. It's, they are symbolic in the sense that they signify the future development of things as well, but in themselves, the descriptions are real language of the things that were happening in those churches at that time in the first century AD. From the next section on, where uh, we have the visions, those um, heavenly scenes, and then all kind of weird symbols, there the text becomes really difficult. So uh, there we will have to really dig deep and see what is happening there. That's a very interesting question. Why is it that in the presence of Jesus Christ, because we had that in the text at one point, when uh, Jesus touched John, yes, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. So why is it that when a human divine encounter happens, either Jesus Christ himself, which is the case here, or an angel in some other cases, or angels in some other cases in the Bible, and you have uh, in the book of Joshua, you have... Uh, in the book of Daniel, you have in the book of Revelation several times. Why is it that people kind of faint, kind of fall down? It's like they cannot stand in the presence of those divine messengers or <clears throat> God himself in a theophany. In this context, the background seems to be fear some sort of fear, either because uh, of his situation, his old, his companions are gone, and um, he's the only one left, so what is going to happen to me now? Or if you take the, the immediate context, it can be the shininess, the splendor, the beauty, all, all that magnificent light, a certain kind of presence, a sense of presence that uh, is uh, too much for a human being, I would say. That's another very good question. What happens with a prophet when he or she, because we have a more modern time prophet, when uh, they are in a vision? On one hand, you can say they lose strength. But you know the story about Ellen White in a vision holding a Bible like this for I don't know how long, but, uh, but a long time, yeah. a heavy Bible. So then uh, you may lose human strength, but you may be given some sort of a supernatural strength in those contexts. What is not clear for us is how the vital functions of a human being are maintained in um, such a context when, when somebody is in a vision. Do they breed? How do they breed? Uh, is the, the functionality of the body the same? 
we, we don't have very many details about the physiological um, happenings with somebody that enters that mode, existential or supra-existential mode. But what was your answer, uh, Eva, to this? Yes, but take, take for instance Jacob, right? Jacob fought the angel in a very human power until the morning, right? So in the context, I don't see any mentioning of any uh, power being lost before the angel touching him in a certain way and say, hey, now, now stop it. So, so he... He did the, the big, uh, strong guy thing uh, up until the morning. So it's not a general rule. That's why I'm saying it's, it's uh, very fluid. Every, every experience seems to be somewhat different. Yes? Do you know the meanings of the names of the seven churches? Do they, <laughs> in, I know in Genesis, the names of the patriarchs tell a story about Jesus. So I yes, uh, that's a very good question. And um, when I was preparing the slide show, I was thinking whether I should put some possible significances of names there. The truth of the matter is that with the exception of a few, where we have some sort of certainty, like Philadelphia. Yeah. I mean, Philadelphia is brotherly love. That's clear language in Greek. Or Laodicea, which is Laos and Dikea together. Laos meaning uh, people and Dikea meaning uh, righteousness or justice can be. Okay? So the people of justice, people of righteousness can be the translation for Laodicea. Um, for Philadelphia, brotherly love. But there are a few of the names to which depending on what source you are using, they will give all kind of significances, trying to make it somehow work with the context. And uh, my principle is, I don't say things where I don't have any certainty. Those names were from actual locations. So Absolutely, but even today we have actual locations that have concrete significance. Like Philadelphia today is the same, right? I don't know if it has a specific significance, though, for those people that live in Philadelphia. Or Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is the um, uh, city of peace. For biblical context, yes, it has significance. But here, we are outside of the Jewish biblical context. Here we are in Asia Minor. So I don't think, well, I don't think, again, I have no biblical proof for that. But for me to say that those names have a specific significance in the context of these messages, then I would have to think that God thought it out in advance before those names were attributed to those cities. And God decided those people will give those names to those cities. So that when he was going to give a message to John to send it to those churches, the lineup will be ready. Maybe it's a little too much, but again, when I look at Philadelphia and Laodicea, it's hard for me not to say, not to see that there is some sort of intentionality there. Because um, I, I cannot avoid the thought that that Laodicea, the word itself, carries a message that goes in line with the message given to that church. Because the message given to that church is practically the message of righteousness by faith. I think most of you know the code here. Uh, what it means, gold refined in fire. What is that? Purification of what? Of faith. A faith, a faith. Uh, white garments, what is that? That's righteousness, it's across the Bible, okay? 
and uh, I sell if uh, ointments and anointing has to do with the Holy Spirit. Then you have here faith, righteousness, and the Holy Spirit. And that's pretty much the language of the teaching of the Bible about righteousness by faith. Some people have even said that Ellen Gould White kind of Yeah, I can go there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, see, Ellen Gould White. And from there you can extrapolate and give significances uh, to all three segments. And then I would not go there. I don't have any <laughs> biblical basis, biblical ground, based on which to say that White, in Ellen White's name, which actually is her husband's name, the White has to do with her character or her impact or, or gold, because gold is gold, or it has to do with this, because that's, that's what is uh, inferred by some people, that Ellen Gould White is uh, gold, uh, white garment, and uh, I sell. I can't say that. So when you laid out these churches in a linear order in uh -huh. future events, how do we determine where we are in that linear event? Well, <clears throat> very good question. So the question is, how, how do we know where we are if indeed this is the layout of history from uh, the time of Jesus, Jesus' return to heaven, say, up to his coming back and the end of history as we know it and the new start, how do we know where we are? Well, I think one of the specific elements that we can see here in the, the final uh, segment, biblically speaking, is how this final picture of Jesus standing at the door ties into what Jesus was talking about. When you will see these things happening, you will see, you will know he's close, he's right at the door. So connecting the signs of the time that Jesus was speaking about, and because he was comparing the signs of the time with uh, the fig tree. How when you see the development of uh, leaves on a fig tree, you know what's next, right? And similarly, when you see the signs happening, you know what's next. And based just on the immediate context, you can see that you have to be here. Now, there's one more element in the wider context of the book of Revelation. And it's this parallelism between the first section, the second, and the third, because you have the seven elements in all three of those. You have uh, the seven churches, then you have the seven uh, seals, and then you have the seven trumpets. And all three of those sections start with the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and end in the same place where this ends. So there you have a confirmation that you are here at the end. Now, the question is, how close to the end? And for that, for that, the simple answer from the text is, hey, he's there knocking at the door. So if he's there knocking at the door, maybe something has to happen inside of our history so that he can get in. I hope that helps. Yes. That explanation is, is very correct into a time element. Mm -hmm. But that's the message of the seven churches is also individual. Individual, theologically addressed to each one of us, even daily. Where am I day? Am I, am I in Ephesus? Or am I in Thyatira? Or yes, we have this chronological, historical reality and we can say we are here, we are at the end. Jesus is knocking at the door. The signs are saying that uh, he is there.
knocking at the door. So that's where we are. But then you have your history, your own history as a personal reality. And uh, you can uh, do a self-evaluation or assessment asking yourself, where am I? Am I in Ephesus? Am I in uh, uh, Smyrna? Am I in uh, Pergamon, Thyatira, um, Sardis, Philadelphia, or Laodicea? If indeed we have these seven stages of history, of the history of Christianity, what was the significance of, say, the first section of the book of Revelation, this one, the seven churches, for somebody living in the third century, or fifth century, or fifteenth century. See the problem? Because they could not really say they were here. Or could they? I have the impression, biblically, even from the time of the Apostle Paul, they, they all lived with a short chronology. And uh, even if they said things that were going to happen, like outlining history, in their mind it was something very quick, rather than a, a long period of time. Although they had periods of time, prof prophecy or prophetic times, from the book of Daniel and then from the book of Revelation. How much they understood from it, if we take seriously what Daniel says, or what God says to Daniel, that at the end of time, then we understand why is it that it was in the 17th, uh, 18th, 19th century when it, it got intensified, this belief that, hey, Jesus is coming and uh, this is the outline of history. First Thessalonians is a proof of uh, short chronological thinking for Paul, but Second Thessalonians turns everything around. This is how I see the Thessalonian uh, dilemma in Paul's case. Paul writes the first letter to the Thessalonians telling them, hey guys, we are not going to, to go there before them, those that died. And the answer to that is resurrection. But he gives you the impression, he believes, he will be alive when Jesus comes back. Okay? So we, those that remain, those that stay alive, we will go with him in the air and we'll be with him forever. But then, probably God reveals something more to him because in the second letter, he goes back. Let me, let me even read it. Because it's, it's very interesting how he puts it. So it's Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. So he's speaking about what he had discussed in the previous letter. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, unless the failing away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, and goes on speaking about future realities. It's obvious that by that time Paul had a wider understanding of what he was talking about before. Because if you go to Thessalonians chapter 4, you will see there, starting with verse um, 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, so this we obviously includes him. So at that time, it seems that he was very convinced that he was going to be one of the survivors <laughs> up to the coming of Jesus Christ. If, if I had asked him after he wrote Second Thessalonians, he would probably adjust 
his answer and say, hey, not so sure. I would love to see him come right now, but some things have to happen. When I first started studying Revelation, my question was, well, how do I know it goes in this straight line, so to speak? Mm -hmm. And my understanding, when, when I came away from my studies were that if you look at the seven churches, God gives the spiritual characteristics of each church. And if you look at history, to validate the spiritual state of God's people, then you can follow it and it goes church by church. And that spiritual state is, you can almost like overlay, you take the seven churches, and you overlay that spiritual characteristic. You can see that. And with the seven seals, the seven trumpets. So the only way that I could kind of draw an analogy is they used to have the Encyclopedia Britannica, so some of you will understand what those were. They used to have an, an anatomy section, and you'd start with the skeletal section, and then you'd overlay the mm -hmm. sheet that had you know, the circulatory and the muscular, etc. <coughs> and that's how I really came to understand Revelation and the seven churches as related to the seven church. <laughs> history. And I don't know if that helps to, to answer your question, because I thought it was a very good question. And those who are being newer to studying Revelation, like I was years ago, that's what helped me to make sense of what was going on. But it's all validated by history of, of the church. Yeah. yeah. I want just to, to repeat that image, because that's one of the probably best ways to get it. Skeleton, muscular system, circulatory system, okay? So you, you can see how they overlay all those uh, sections. One, two, and three, which are on these, this side of this uh, triangle. This is the central piece. And from this piece on, this is all final events. So this is history up to this point. And this is final events and we'll show when we get there how the text indicates that. Because again, you don't have to believe it just because somebody says so. You want to see in the text that that is the case indeed. So that's a good point and you will see that in section three already and then section four in a special way, you have the time prophecies that tie into the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel leaves you Somewhat like that. Okay. And God tells him, uh, Daniel, you have to go. You are going to die. And uh, history will go on. But in the final days, uh, knowledge will increase. And people will run to and fro. And they will search the scrolls. That's the meaning there. And they will start understanding. And, and, and there is a very important principle here when it comes to understanding biblical prophecy and that is prophecy is not given for the one that is here to know exactly what is going to happen in advance like I'm here in the first century and God gives me uh, prophecy so I know exactly what is going to happen all the way to the end of uh, history that's not the role of prophecy the role of prophecy is that if I live here and see what has happened already, I can have faith. My faith is strengthened because I can rely on what God has worked in prophecy up to this point. If I'm here in history, then I have an even longer time period that I can rely on and say, wow, that's amazing. If I'm here at the end of, uh, of uh, prophecy, then I will say, wow, that's amazing. Look how all those things are lined up and are fulfilled. And if there is still a, a little segment based on what I have already seen in history, I can have the certainty, yeah, the one that took care of this whole segment up to this point will take care of me from this point on as well. Thank you so much for coming out. For next time, please read chapters 
four, five, six, and seven. Lord, we thank you so much for the insights of your word. And we pray that you will continue to work with us, that we will search the scripture, we will get more and more understanding from you. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.